Thank you, Mike, for playing. And uh, we do uh, miss those that are away on vacation. And we're thinking, of course, of uh, Mike and Jess uh, away today. And so I'm thankful to uh, be allowed to lead you all in worship. And I'm thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in that. This morning I've entitled the message, and I want to greet those that will be listening online as well. Thank you for uh, just weekly uh, joining with us, whether through video uh, or just through the audio. And again, we apologize this week will only be the audio. And uh, we also are apologizing that it will be a couple uh, days later uh, for you to have seen. But those of you that are here, thank you for being here. And uh, we trust that God will uh, work in our midst here this morning, I've entitled the message, Seeing Jesus Even in the Hardships. Uh, you may take off your masks now if you would like um, during the preaching time, but Seeing Jesus Even in the Hardships. And what I want to do this morning is I want to take some time observing the story that we have already been learning, but more from an elevated view. Uh, it's interesting that Moses, who is the human author of the first five books of the Bible, he gives Joseph more time in Genesis than he does any of the other characters, which I found that fascinating when I was pondering that uh, this week because of the significance of Genesis other main characters. You know, of course, you've got Adam and Eve, you've got, you've got Noah, you've got the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it becomes even more of a just pronounced amazement when you think of how little Joseph has any kind of time you know, for the rest of the Bible. You know, you'll hear a lot about Abraham and, and, and different people that are, are mentioned, but God... God, of course, is sovereign in, in, in how He does all of that, and He is He's all powerful. He has got all knowledge, and He is second to none. There is no one that can rival Him. There's no equals. There's no competitors when it comes to God. And the fact that evil is rampant in His creation, though it shocks us, is no surprise to God. Uh, there are it is only allowed by his permission. So from time to time, evil may seem to be running wild, but in fact, it is always on a leash. And we should be grateful that we have never seen really how bad it actually can become in this world. But you think of kind of what, what leads up to our story here. You've got the sin of Adam and Eve, which of course plunges all of mankind into sin. And then that's in chapter number three of Genesis. And then chapter number four, you have Cain killing uh, his, his brother Abel. And then in chapter number six, we learn of how God is going to literally bring a flood, but God describes mankind as their actions and their thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. And so from the very beginning, you see this kind of just this wave of evil. And if you were following along in our Thursday night Bible study on the big picture, when we just talked about how the world is, why the world is the way it is, and it's because of course sin and, uh, and evil has crept in. And then of course the flood comes and uh, Noah, who preached for 120 years, and his only converts that came with him were his family. That's it. So for 120 years, God pronounces judgment that's coming. And then he gives this ama amazing grace of 120 years. He's a preacher of righteousness. He literally allows um, uh, uh, Methuselah to live the longest. Okay, And yet no one else came because why? There was so much evil in the world. And then after the flood, you've got drunkenness and incest with his children in a cave. Then that leads to the Tower of Babel. And then ultimately you come to Abraham and Sarah who've been promised a seed and they cannot have children and they're up 100 years old. And so then you have, of course, Hagar entering into the picture. And then, of course, you have Lot and you have Sodom and Gomorrah and you have Jacob and you have Esau and the scheming that went along with that and the birthright. And then you come to the story in which we have 
been reading of how the brothers did what they did and lied and literally stole and, and, and just, just rampant types of sin. Exactly why God allows evil in His creation. You and I will never really know. God doesn't tell us, nor does He require to tell us. He's God and we are not. We cannot understand everything about God, but we have enough information to satisfy the basic of questions that there is a God and that we need to be reconciled to Him. In many cases, God chooses to let us go through whatever evil or whatever trouble we may be facing at the moment. Often He lets us just continue in that. He could have prevented it. He could have uh, made it happen quicker. He could have given us an easy path. But often he allows the, 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 the grind of life. He allows you to go through that struggle and you have to endure it. He could end it entirely, but probably will not until he is through using it for his purposes. So if we take a close look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, just somewhat of an overview from it, we notice that something interesting about evil is that... that, that um, the presence in the world, it's considered an intruder into God's good creation, but it's allowed. It's allowed to prowl. It's allowed to uh, have its time for a moment with a considerable degree of freedom. Sometimes it even looks like evil exceeds all of what is going on in the world. It has limitless power, it seems like, but good, it seems just like for a season. And when we think of God, sometimes we think that His hands are tied. Sometimes we're wondering, God, can you do anything? God, can you, can you change anything? And you just have this, this evil in our world. It seems like it is ruling. Evil is good. Good is good. God never uses good for evil, but God uses something amazing at times, evil for good. He's the ruler of all. In the stories of the patriarchs in Genesis, they're wonderful illustrations of evil being exploited for good. One of the clearest pictures comes to us in the account of Joseph. Young Joseph, of course, he's mistreated. He's violently abused, he's tricked, he's kidnapped, he's enslaved, he's falsely accused, he's imprisoned. And yet every time he's kicked, it seems like every time he is abused, he is mysteriously bumped up one more rung of the ladder. He moves from the deep hole in the beginning of the story to the position now where he is literally the prime minister, the second in command of all of Egypt. And so God uses all of the evil that's directed toward Joseph as the raw material to construct not only his preservation from starvation and death, but also his brothers and also the actual people that Joseph now serves. And so we've looked at the character of these brothers that brought such evil upon Joseph, and we've seen their sins are many. Uh, the sins of lying and deception, the sins of sexual indulgence, the sins of disloyalty and betrayal. And one of the questions that we have kind of, kind of thought about is how does God bring blessing upon people like this? Or these are, listen, this is God's people. And I went through the lineage of, of God's people here and just kind of, and kind of the, the sin of early mankind, and yet God is still seeking to bring good from this evil. And so we've been following the story of how God in His kindness, He brought great change in these men in which they came to hate, the, 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 which the, the, they came to hate, which ultimately they would begin to love Him, of course. So this truly is a story of hope. It tells us that God can change the hardest of hearts. God can redirect the most wayward life. Listen to me. Do you realize that these brothers on the pages of Scripture are unfolding early human trafficking? 
Now, the result might not be exactly the same as what we are facing in our globe today and certainly in our country. But listen, these men, I mean, they, 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 they literally sold their brother. They, they were, of course, going to kill him. And so then they chose maybe a more right path, I don't know, and sold their brother into service and into slavery. I mean, I want you to think about that. And yet God still wants to rescue them. God still wants to bring blessing into them. Sarah and I were talking just the other day. I mean, what kind of, it's like, what kind of heart on all of the levels of what we see going on in our world today, what kind of heart would, would, would give somebody up from that? What kind of heart would take somebody? And then what kind of heart would, would, would purchase that? On all levels, it's disgusting, right? On all levels, it is just evil. And yet God wants to redeem that. God wants to take even brothers like this and bring about radical change. And so what I want us to do is I want us to kind of take a big picture here for the next few moments. And I want us to look at the specific identities of Joseph and Jesus. And I want you to see that even in trouble, even in heartache, even in when evil is abounding, you can and should be looking for Jesus. And so if you want to write some things down, just some some simple thoughts. If not, that's totally fine as well. Who is Joseph? I want you to I want you to kind of take yourself kind of maybe out of just the the the, the day-to-day of the story. And who is Joseph? Joseph is the ruler who knows them even though they do not know him. He's the ruler that knows them even though they do not know him. He was speaking a different language. We've talked about that, right? His entire head would have been shaved. He would have worn the, uh, the, the, the makeup that those in leadership would have worn there in Egypt. So the brothers did not recognize him because he certainly had changed. But Joseph, he knows all about the brothers. He knows who they are and what they have done, but they do not recognize him. Turn to Genesis 43. Genesis 43, we learned last week they've been brought into a banquet. They are seated in exactly the order of their birth from the oldest to the youngest. Look at verse 33. And they sat before him, the firstborn, according to his birthright. Remember last week we learned that there are the three tables. Joseph sat at one, his brother sat at a second table, and then the servants would have sat at a third. But at this brother's table, the firstborn, according to his birthright, and the youngest, according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another. They must have been wondering, how in the world does an Egyptian ruler know our birthright. The great ruler seems to know all about them, even though at this point they do not know him. Who else is, who else is Joseph? A bigger picture, kind of kind of up above the, above the story. The brother who loves them, he's the brother who loves them, even though they do not love him yet. He's the brother that loves them, even though yet they do not love him. See, when the brothers spoke about Joseph, they referred to him as the man. Five different times in this story, the brothers refer to him that way, and Jacob said it twice. That is exactly why the the way people who do not know God, they they, they kind of speak about God this way, right? How many of you have heard the references of like, you know, the, the man upstairs, right? When, when they don't know God, they just disrespect him that way. You know, hey, the man upstairs, or they'll say something like, God, whoever he, she, it may be. So the person the brothers refer to as the man is not only the ruler who completely knows them, but he is also the brother who loves them. And you see this throughout the story, but you see it especially in verse number 30, when Joseph sees Benjamin. Look at verse number 30. And Joseph made haste. For his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. What the text is telling us here, that that his, his heart was moved with such compassion for his brother that he had to let this out. And so he 
went into his own chamber and he began to weep. He had such love for these individuals. Of course, they were his brother, but they didn't even know it yet. They were receiving love, yet they were not giving love yet. Who was Joseph? A bigger picture of his, of his identity. He's the ruler who knows them, even though they don't know him. He's the brother that loves them, even though they don't love him back yet. And then thirdly, he's the victim who's ready to forgive them. Even though they do not yet know it is him that they have sinned against. But he's ready. He's ready to forgive them. The brothers' consciences, they've been awakened. They know that they've sinned. But what they do not know is that the person that they've sinned against is the one whose table they are now eating at. I think you probably can see where this message is headed. So then, who is Jesus? Who's Jesus? Big picture identity. He is the ruler who knows you. He is the sovereign God who knows all things. Nothing, nothing is hidden from him. Before a thought even goes through your mind, God is aware of that. Before a word ever comes off of your lips, he is aware of what you are thinking and what you are going to say. God completely knows. He knows everything about you. Now, how that feels to you, how that understanding of that knowledge feels depends upon your theology and your view of God, on if he stands against you or if God is for you, or if you are against God or you are for God. So it all depends on our understanding of who he is. See, David knew that God was for him. Turn to Psalm 139, please. He knew, that, he knew that God was for him. He knew that God was not against him. But in Psalm 139, this is a great chapter about David just kind of opening up his heart. He's just raw and authentic before the Lord, asking him to search his, uh, his heart and his way. That's at the end of the chapter. But look at verse number one of Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Basically saying, hey, you know when I'm asleep and you know when I'm awake. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. And look what he says in verse number six. Such knowledge is too wonderful to me. It is too high. I cannot attain unto it. Lord, you, Lord, you, you, you know me completely in this knowledge. It, it's too wonderful for me. I, it, it's hard for me to even, even to think about it. It's wonderful that you know me. How else would I ever be invited into your banquet? It's wonderful that you know me. How else, and and, and that you love me. How would I ever be invited into your house? And we saw just the types throughout this story so far, the banquet table as well as the house. Turn to John chapter 4, please. John chapter number 4, I think about the woman at the well. Jesus is also there at Jacob's well and He asked the woman when she comes to give him a drink of water. And they have this altercation or this this conversation back and forth. And ultimately, he says, Hey, I want to give you living water. And there's there's a continued conversation between them. And the woman, and then ultimately, Jesus said, Well, I want you to go, I want you to go get your husband. And we know the woman says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, what you've said is correct. You've had five and the one you're with right now is not your husband. And there's this amazing conversation that's with them, w- w- between the two of them. And she talks about worshiping and how can I worship? And he's like, I am the one that you ought to worship. She's like, I will, I- I'll worship when there's someone that comes and tells me everything that I've ever done. It's like, I am he. Look at verse number 29. Come 
and see. Well, earlier in the chapter, she her, leaves her water pot and she's run into the city. The disciples have come back and she says, come and see, which told me, uh, come see a man, which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? I mean, she's running to town and she's rejoicing. How could she be full of joy? Even though Jesus had literally told her all of the stuff that she has done wrong in her life. Why is she glad? Why is she happy? Why is she telling others about this man? He told me every single thing I did. Well, Jesus was literally exposing the sin of her life. Why would she do that? Because she had discovered that the one who knew her also loved her and that there was hope for her in him. And so we must understand that we have a ruler that knows you. He knows everything about you. Who else is Jesus? Well, Jesus is the ruler who knows you. And he's also the brother who loves you. And when you and I begin to get a taste of God's love for us, it will not be long before you will find your heart and your love returning to Him. I believe I said this last week, we love Him because He first loved us. And so not only does He know everything about you, He chose to take on human form and become like you. That's what we mean by there by brother. Of course, we become a joint heir with Jesus Christ when we trust him as our Savior. Who is Jesus? Well, Jesus, of course, is God in the flesh. Who is your ruler? He is your brother because he became man in Jesus Christ. And then he, what does he do? Is He stands beside you and he takes on the victim because he becomes ready to forgive you. So what happened to Jesus? Well, Jesus is the victim who suffered on an account of our sin. All of our sins are, are literally sins against him. David in his great confession in Psalm 51, who had sinned with Bathsheba and then her husband Uriah and really just the, the whole nation. He says, before you, God, and you, God alone, have I sinned. He was acknowledging that all of our sin ultimately, yes, is against people, but ultimately every single sin is against God. And so he was taking our sins upon him that were against him. That is why our sins were laid on him at the cross. Jesus Christ became our sacrifice. Jesus Christ became the victim. But Jesus is no longer the victim. Joseph is no longer the victim. Joseph is no longer in a pit. Joseph is no longer in prison. Joseph has now been elevated to where all of the known world, literally where, where the famine was, were coming to him for the food. And so Jesus is no longer this this man that was, that was beaten and that was crowned with thorns and was crucified and is buried in a grave. No, he rose again. And Jesus right now, he's exalted and he's standing ready to forgive. He's standing ready to welcome all who will be reconciled to him. All of those that they will come to him, he will call his brothers and sisters and he will seat us at a table and where we will feed, he will feed us and nourish us even into eternal life. You are known, you are loved, and you can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is the message with which you need to preach to yourself on a daily basis and needs to ooze out of your life to a world around us. That there's a God who knows them intricately and yet he still loves them. He knows every single thing about them. He knows every thought. He knows every action. He knows every secret viewing on any phone. or device. He knows everything. And yet he still loves them. And yet he moves heaven and earth. Why? Because his desire is to bring about blessing. His desire is to bring about reconciliation and heart change and we will begin to see how that happens here in this story but what i wanted to do is i wanted to kind of take a bigger picture of what's going on radical evil for sure we've got it in our world today wicked but it was also in joseph's day and god was literally salvaging his people through even the most evil and heinous of acts done unto Joseph. Why? Because God was someday going to bring, allow evil unto his own son to bring many sons to glory. 
And so when we think about the song that we sang, how deep the Father's love for us, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch how evil our world is, how evil the world leading up to our story was. And by the way, I didn't go over everything. To make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away. Why? Because he's burying our sins as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. And then this is my, my, my favorite line here. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Listen, let that permeate your heart. Let the bigger picture of the story of who Joseph is simply just pointing us to, to Christ and what he's done. He knows everything about you and he still loves you and he still went to death, obviously for you. And he stands ready to reconcile, ready to forgive. If you've never trusted Christ as your savior, make today that day. I, I don't know exactly what's on in your heart, but listen, this is the message with which we live our lives to people around us. Now, the Bible also does say that some save us by fire, okay? And so some need to, you know, learn about the judgment and learn about, and learn about hell and all that. I'm not saying that you would ever remove any of that. You don't remove sin. Jesus didn't remove sin in John 4. He literally was exposing the sin of this woman, ultimately because he was going to give the grace and the radical favor that is found in salvation with him. And so may I encourage you to... See the wonder and the beauty of Christ, even in this story of Joseph. And as we sang a few weeks ago, your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. Your father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. And where we find these men right now in our story, and we'll pick it up again next week. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Let's ask the Lord right now. Everyone, head, every head bowed, every eye closed.